In this video, we're going to do a complete review of the brand new Aza Aero 480 case, a mid-tower case that's actually pretty big for a mid-tower case. We're going to start off with a complete build inside of it in fast forward, and then we're going to do some thermal and some noise testing to see just how loud and how hot or cool the system gets inside of this case. And then we're going to end it with my final thoughts. Got a lot to do, so let's get started.
match all those pins together. And we heard the little teeny tiny click. So, so far in this video, I've walked you through building completely from the ground up inside of the Aza case. It's pretty simple and I like the way everything's laid out inside of this case, except the PCIe mechanism for the video card or any other PCIe device or PCI device inside of the system. I don't like the way those covers come off and there is more wrong with the case and we'll find out a little bit later on in this review. Now you may notice that the build looks a little bit different than it did during this build and I'll explain why in the course of this review. So stay tuned and let's move on to the next part. So as you can see right now, it's going to go to un. Un on this means it's below 30 dB. That's how quiet it is in this room with this system running. The reason for that is first off the video card, the fans aren't spinning because the system is idle right now. It is on, you can see on the screen and all the fans spinning, but because there isn't really graphically intensive going on, the fans aren't spinning. So that keeps it nice and cool. The liquid cooling unit, these three fans up here and the pump, they're incredibly quiet right now as well because they're not spinning very fast and the pump is not pumping as much right now because it's idle. So the processor slows down a little tiny bit as well as the case fans the case fans come with the case obviously everything is connected through pwm i have it configured in the bias as pwm so that it only speeds up when it needs that extra fan speed so you'll notice the fans on the rear and the fans on the front are kind of doing their own thing then as well as the fans on the liquid cooling unit and the video card now by design the rgb controller on the motherboard should control everything inside of this system. Not in this particular system, but not all by design as well. So for example, RGB Fusion will control the Gigabyte card. That's a given. And on the EVGA side, the CLCX software will take care of that. That's always a given with EVGA. Now, the RGB software Aura Sync on the motherboard should control the front three fans and the rear fan, but it's not working. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what it does control. Aza states that the RGB fans are controlled using LED button. So by pressing this button, I can change all the lighting. 
and then if I hold it for three seconds, it resets the RGB lighting. You would think to match the Aura Sync, but the website doesn't state what it is certified with. It states all addressable RGB devices can sync with the motherboard allowing the motherboard software to control the lighting directly. Now, typically they'll say Aura Sync, Mystic Lighting, and all the other ones, but they don't give you names on here. So that tells me that they aren't certified for them. They haven't paid the royalties from them in order for those fans to be controlled by that. Now, mind you, I've only used this Asus motherboard, but the fact that it doesn't sync is a big issue. Now, I use the Z690 DDR4 board and the DDR5 board. It killed my DDR4 board. Mind you, the board, everything worked, but the RGB headers, there's one up here and two down there, didn't work. So that was the big fiasco I had with Asus. The board just stopped working. Now, I can't 100% blame these fans. I don't know if the board killed the fans or if the fans killed the board. So I already made the board. Thankfully, finally, Asus went through with it after four RMAs. That's a different story. But I also had these fans changed by Aza and still they're not working. The board works. I was able to confirm with a fractal design fan that every single RGB port works. It works through Aura Sync, but these fans will not work through Aura Sync. Now that's a pretty big letdown. If you care a lot about RGB lighting in your system, I would highly recommend that maybe if you do buy this case, you buy different fans. Now many of you are going to buy different fans regardless, but you would need to buy four in the front and one in the rear. All four of these are 120 millimeter fans, the three in the front and the one in the rear. The fans themselves do very well, they light very well, and they blow very well. In a minute, you'll see just how loud they get, but again, you can't control that. You can control it with this button, which doubles as a reset button, but for those of you that have RGB and want to use your RGB lighting, that's totally up to you. You have to use this button, which to me is better served as a reset button. But if you don't have an RGB header on your motherboard, this might be the perfect case for you. Now, because the side panel is off, we have a case of neutral airflow. There is no pressure whatsoever inside of the system. It's not negative, it's not positive. And with that, again, we're going to get the UN because all of the components are incredibly quiet. Everything's idle right now. Now, typically the pressure comes from the side panel. Right now it's pretty much neutral since there is no pressure whatsoever. We have some air coming in, some air leaving, some air leaving, air doing whatever it wants here, but it's all doing what it wants because there's no pressure. We don't have a side panel right now. Well, normally we can put a side panel in and that'll relieve it, but this is not glass. This is porous, looks, feels like a, a, Br a Brillo pad almost. It is not solid. Then on top of that, once you do have it screwed in, it's not like it's solid either. It's very flimsy, very cheap. Now mind you, this does not vibrate while it's being used. It's still very silent, but the fact that if you touch it, it just, it feels very cheap. The pressure part, I've noticed Typically you want positive airflow, but this case, because of this, decides on its own what kind of airflow you want. So right now we're going to go ahead and do some testing. We're gonna test on the GPU, then on the CPU, and then on both, just to see what the temperatures get up to and noise levels and everything along those lines as we normally do. So we're going to start off with the GPU. We're gonna open up Furmark. And I've already configured this to be as hot as it can be, anti-aliasing all the way up on with burn-in, extreme burn-in, post effects, everything set at its highest. Oh, and I did forget. All right. So my capture card only captures 60 Hertz, but because I'm on vertical sync off, I can go ahead and show you there coming in at 141 frames per second. Now the hottest the GPU will get is around 65 degrees and the CPU will get up to around 79 degrees. 
I'm gonna go ahead and leave this running for about 20 minutes and we will come back. So stressing the system for at least 20 minutes, we can see the GPU is at 63 degrees, it'll go to 62, 63. It's being utilized 99%, sucking up 445 watts, the video card alone. On my WhatsApp, the system is taking 589 watts right now. That's a lot of power for, or 591 watts now. Now that's a lot of power, especially alone for the video card, but you can see that it hasn't burnt up. It's 63 degrees right now, incredibly cool. And let's see just how loud it gets. I am about a foot away. Seeing how hot or how loud it's gotten, we can see this got up to 51 dB. Now, the microphone is all the way on the top of the system, and I'm keeping it a little dark right now so that you can see more detail. Now, at the top of the system, we can see just how loud it gets. All right, about 64 dB. Now this is going to be for the CPU. Now coming along the back, on the rear of the GPU, where most of that is going to come from. Now 51.5, it's not as loud as I thought it would be. Maybe I need to move it a little bit more. Fifty one point eight DB, so it's not as loud, sorry, as I thought it would be. Now heat twenty seven thirty I'm trying to hook onto one of these pieces of metal back here. Twenty seven thirty DB or thirty degrees. Celsius and then let's see just how hot the fan back here is getting or the air coming out of here is getting 34 degrees 35 37 now, we're not going to have a properly cooled system unless the air coming in in the front is nice and cool. You see along the front, 22 degrees, 21. So like the side panel, the front has that same kind of meshing. But remember, when these fans rev up when these fans up here rev up then we're pulling air from the outside and I'll show you that in one second now we're getting a lot of heat right over here right where the video card is expelling so bring you in a little bit closer so here we can see we're at 41 degrees now this is hitting the rear of the card, the top of the card, the metal plate, 41 degrees. Yeah, so she gets hot, but not horribly hot. But I can feel a lot of that heat right over here. Now if I could find my FLIR I would show you that, but I can't find it right now. Now let's see what happens testing the CPU. Now, after having left the GPU cooled down a little bit, right now it's at 39 degrees. Not much hotter than when it was first initiated. Now we're going to test the CPU. For that, we're going to use IDA64 Extreme. All synthetics, but to build up the most heat. And then Ida will tell us the temperatures here. Mind you, it might be a little bit difficult to read, but the temperatures will be right over here. So let's start for 20 minutes.
All right, so it took me a little bit longer, but after 30 minutes of testing, we can see from about a foot away, system's about 66 dB. I hit 67 there on the way out. Now on the rear, on the rear fan, about 25, 24, About 24 the air escaping from the rear fan and 23, 24, 25, 26, 26 is the hottest I've seen so far and that's coming off of the top. Now I'm hitting the heat sink on the motherboard. 26 degrees is the hottest and that was around right there, yeah? 27 degrees. Again, this is Celsius, 28 degrees. So for some reason, this side is getting hotter. It's interesting. So 28 degrees over here has been the hottest noise level wow it hit 70 db so can it really be 71 db it's almost 73 db that's incredibly loud but we are right over the radiator which is where it would be its loudest now coming along the front. You can see the air coming in is 20 dB. Coming in a little bit closer. Or 20 degrees, sorry, not 20 dB. 22 degrees. So nice and cool air coming in the front. About 53 dB, maybe 54. 64. So this system can get incredibly loud. That is, of course, when you're stressing it 100%. And with that, stressing the CPU alone Right now we're consuming 326 watts. So now let's see what noise level and power consumption with everything. So here we can see about 20 minutes of testing. The GPU is about 64 degrees. It has hit 65 degrees, 98% utilization. The CPU is at the highest about 85 degrees. And that's still pretty low considering the temperature of everything within the system now the system is taking right now 825 watts 830 watts let me show you what i'm looking at so i do all of my wattage testing right here on the whatsapp.net we hit about 830 watts you can see right over here watts and then this is connected into the power supply on the system so here I can test to see when I'm stressing the CPU alone, how much that's taking. When I'm stressing the video card, how much that's taking. And then when I'm stressing the entire system, how much that's taking. So this is taking overall system power utilization, not just the CPU or not just the video card, not just the SSD, overall system power utilization. Now, a funny thing on positive versus negative airflow. As I mentioned earlier, this is however it wants to be. It could be positive one second. It could be negative the other. Now, I know that sounds really stupid to say, but let me show you. So blocking all of the airflow, you notice how this paper is kind of just going flowing there air is coming out air is getting pushed out 
from all the air getting pushed in from the front of the case without this video card sucking in air and without the radiator at the top sucking in much air this is doing the most exhausting of the air now let me show you what happens once we turn on the video card and the liquid cooling unit pay attention right here So you saw when it was starting up, it pushed it out and then it sucked it back in. So now we're seeing negative airflow. It's trying to suck in as much air as possible to keep itself cool, to keep the pressure inside of the system there. If we were to release this, it'll get louder. But then we push it back, it gets sucked right back in there. So I tested this way, both with this air pressure and without that air pressure, there was only about one or two degree difference between both. I honestly expected there to be a lot more heat with like this. So very interesting finding there. The temperatures inside of your PC are going to be relative to the ambient temperature inside of your house. If your house is 83 degrees, your PC is only going to be a little bit cooler than that if you have awesome airflow and cooling inside of your system. So if you want the inside of your PC to be nice and cool, you need the temperature in your house to be nice and cool. Typically, I keep it at 63 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 17.2 degrees Celsius. My PC loves it. I love it. My wife and kids, not so much. So that's a lot on this case. The case is awesome. It has a lot of great features, but there are a lot of downfalls. The biggest one to me was the RGB lighting. Now, mind you, it's just lighting, but so many things that could have been easily avoided. So to start off with, this is the main fan that goes in the rear of the system. Now, it has all of these cables coming out of it. This is the master fan. In order for all the others to work, you need this fan. Okay, and out of all these cables that come out of it, this is the addressable RGB cable for the controller. So you press the reset button on the top of the case, and then it changes the RGB lighting on the fans with this. If you don't use this, you can use that button as a reset button, but that's what this guy is, okay? Then there is this addressable RGB header that you would just connect into an addressable RGB header on the motherboard. Then there is this cable. So this portion of the cable, you would connect the PWM fan into here, and then this would go into a PWM header, and then this would go into another adapter. The adapter would be on the other fan. So you would pl plug in this four pin adapter cable into this four pin cable right in here. Now, we don't usually use these kind of cables on anything. If anything, other than the EVGA CLC X360 that I use in the system, they have the same kind of cables. I haven't seen these before on any other machine. And then we plug this guy into another fan and so on. Okay, and then of course this would plug into the PWM on the motherboard and if you wanted to an extender right over here. The extender comes out to here and then plugs into right over here and then plugs into SATA power, powering all of the fans. Now alone with this addressable RGB header, you will not get any lighting on the fans. But on the fractal fan, if you wanted to use just this alone to get lighting, 
if you don't want the fan spinning, this would work just fine. That doesn't work on these fans, any one of the four fans. So they require a lot of power. And again, they require this one, the main rear one, to plug into these three and provide these three with power. That's why you have that SATA adapter. And that comes in the accessory box, as you saw. And then that cable plugs right in here into through that strand. So your reset would be coming from the case into that cable I showed you before. And now your reset button is that RGB button. And then if that wasn't enough, the part that could actually damage the system is the rear IO, the PCIe slots. Now, normally these two would have been like this one. This is one that you just kind of pop open and then you twist it out. And this is what came out of it. Now you have to be incredibly careful when you twist this out because you can actually hit a component on the motherboard and break something on the motherboard. So I highly recommend, so I highly recommend before you install a motherboard here, the very first slot is going to be empty. The next two slots or one or two, depending on how thick your video card is, you're going to want to take it out first before you put the motherboard in. Now I'm going to show you here real quick how it would look. So these top two would have looked just like this one. So you have to push it and then once you push it you see how it comes out and it's not screwed in even though it does have a screw you have to twist it out but this you need to back and forward back and forward back and forward until it snaps loose now you see how doing that you can hit that little diode right there or maybe not uh, it's so close that you might actually snap that loose so again it's best to do that when the motherboard isn't in there or if you're just incredibly careful but still i would recommend remove the two that you know you need or the one before you put the motherboard in in case you mess up the case does bring two additional pcie slot covers so you just don't have a bare hole there now you definitely want to be careful with that one because that could actually mess up your machine. Where we went before that we had to rewire everything, that it looks completely different to the way it was. Let me show you, let me bring in a little bit closer. Right now the panel fits and it fits nicely. Not a big issue, but sometimes you get all these cables strung along and then the system wasn't able to close because of how much those cables fit in. So mind you, it's not as nice as it was during the initial build, but we had that huge strand of cables here and it didn't allow me to close over here because there's not a whole lot of space. I'll go ahead and put down below how much space we have over here, but you can see that it's not a lot. So I had to spread things out a little bit more and it doesn't look as nice, it works. It just doesn't look as nice. Then on the PCIe side, you can see over here, we're using the cable mod case. And that gives you a lot more room over here. And then of course, we're able to bend it at a certain point. And then you can see right over here, you can barely see that. And it doesn't really stick out much or at all, allowing you to put that side panel on. And then removing that cable, removed a huge cluster of cables here because that cable mod cable goes out to four directly into this EVGA power supply. Their cables will go either as extensions or full cable replacements. That's pretty nice. And that one was only about 45 bucks. Definitely a great investment. Then I made a little nicer these cables over here. Now I didn't show you this part because in my madness of changing out and testing over and over and over with all the different fans, to test the RGB to see if it was something I was doing or just a way it was configured. I rebuilt the system probably about 20 times and I didn't want you to have to go through all of that. So that was a huge frustration. And then the other weird thing is that side panel over here, that nylon meshing. And you can see up close here that it's just a meshing. It's metal, but it's cheap. It's like I can, bend it and 
you know, sounds like a thunder machine or a lightning machine. It's very cheap, very flimsy, and that aids in the cost being so low. Now, because that's so cheap and cheesy, the front panel is the same, and this was another defect I found when they shipped it. Now, it may be slightly hard to see, but you can see there are bends right over here, kind of like somebody hit this with a hammer, and that goes across all of the case. It's more noticeable on the bottom right-hand corner, but as you come up here, you can also see them right along here and right along here. I tried to get behind this, which is easy. Just take off the panel, pull it off, and push them in, but they wouldn't bend back into place. So again, it was another thing that was just really cheap and flimsy. If this case was under $100, I would say, yeah, just replace the fans, but it's over $100, slightly over. Mind you, still pretty budget, but I don't know that I can wholeheartedly recommend this case. So the Aza Aero 480 case, it's a very nice case. I want to like it a lot more, especially for the fact that you can fit a 490 in there with an adapter different from that what comes in the box you have to get the one from cable mod and it fits in a lot easier over here mind you when they come out with a 90 degree angle it'll fit so much better but you're able to get it in there and with a little bend you can do that a little bend be careful everything fits in there nice you're able to cable it nicely you do have to be careful as i mentioned earlier with the back here that you don't want to put too many cables in all at once but you're able to make it look nice now the downside is these are the fans that were in there before i don't recommend these fans at all unless you don't have an argb or a addressable rgb header on your motherboard you want to use that rgb button then go for it keep it but if you don't want to use that button you want to use your reset button as a reset button buy your own fans if you want to use this You'd have to go for 120 millimeter fans, four, three in the front, one in the rear, but you can have your own RGB if you buy your own fans. The fans that it comes with are nice, but not for RGB. The Fractal fans, they were great. They did the RGB, they did everything perfectly fine. The other downside was the cheesy, flimsy side panel that looked like a shirt Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails would wear. And then, of course, the PCIe slot covers that can potentially damage your motherboard. And the biggie for me is the fact that it only has two USB 3.0s and no USB 2.0s, or maybe an additional 3.0 as long as you have an additional header. That kind of kills it. And then, if anything, if you were going to leave me alone with only two USB 3.0s, there's no USB Type-C. There's a lot right, and there's also a lot wrong with this case. If it was $100, maybe $80, I'd say go for it, buy yourself some new fans. It's about $120. Check on the pricing in the description below just to make sure, in my Amazon affiliated link, just to make sure. But if it's at $120, I'd probably say go for something else. That's my two cents on the Aza Aero 480. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. I'm incredibly curious to see what you think about this case. Iggy with this bites for you up. See you guys.